So this week we are going to cover um, chapter five, which is all about data transformation using specifically um, dplyr tools in R. So we'll just dive right in. Uh, oops. There we go. Okay, so the outline of the chapter is as follows. Uh, we'll go through a little introduction. We'll talk about the filter function, the arrange function, the select function, mutate, summarize, and then end with group mutate. Okay, so data transformation helps you get the data in exactly the right form that you need. So it could look a lot of different ways, but um, some of the options are listed here. So you can create new variables. You might create summaries. You might want to rename variables reorder observations and lots of other things. Uh, and this chapter in the book uses the NYC flights 13 package, which just has um, about 330,000 flights that departed from New York City in 2013. And the data comes from the US Bureau of Transportation Statistics. So this is just a peek at what the data set looks like. Um, and so not all the columns are displayed here. Um, but you might be able to, can you see my cursor? And let me know. Yeah, it's visible. Okay, great. And so we can only see some, um, some of the variables listed here and then the remainder of them are listed below. And let's see, what does my next one say? Okay, so one of the things to point out here, this is just a, a shortened version of the data frame. But one of the things to look at is this row underneath the variable names, which has the class of that variable. And so I've listed four of them here. So there could be integers, like this one, uh, doubles or real numbers. There might be character vectors or strings in a data frame, and there may also be date times. And those are the ones that are seen in this particular data set. But there may be others, other data sets that have additional um, classes like logical factors and just dates. Some of the basics of dplyr is that you can pick observations by their values using the filter function. You can reorder the rows using the arrange function. You can pick variables by their names with select. You can create new variables with functions uh, of existing variables using mutate and you can also collapse many values down to a single summary using summarize, which is spelled here with an S, but you can spell it with a Z. And it reads the same. And then there's also group by, um, which gets the above functions to operate group by group rather than, rather than on the entire data set. So in terms of how these functions work, uh, the first argument is the data frame, and we'll see more examples down the road. Um, and then other arguments describe what it is that we're gonna do with that data frame. And then the result is a new data frame. So filtering rows um, with filter lets you subset observations based on their values. So for example, here we have our flights data set and um, the data set is, whoops, is contained in the first argument here and then it's filtered by two additional um, arguments. So there's month, which is set equal to one, and then there's day, which is set equal to one as well. And so if we look at the data frame below, we can see that, um, well, we can't see the whole data frame, but we can see that it's uh, filtered by January being the month, month one, and then the first day in January, where the column day is also equal to one. You can make comparisons when you use this function, and R provides sort of the standard set of comparison operators. So greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to, um, not equal to, which is exclamation point followed by an equal sign, and then equal, which we're already familiar with, which is two equal signs. And then also there's logical operators that you can use. So the ampersand uh, is and, the uh, vertical, vertical pipe is what I usually call that. I'm not sure if there are other names for it, um, is, the, is or, and then the exclamation point is a not. And, um, and this image here comes from the book and it just shows the different kinds of operators that you might use depending on what you're looking for. 
Another thing to note is missing values. So missing values, which are also known as NAs, which are also known as not availables, represent an unknown value. And they're also contagious, meaning almost any operation that involves an unknown value will also be unknown. And this is also important because when you use the filter function, filter only includes rows where the condition is true. So it includes, um, or excludes, I think they should say excludes, excludes both false and NA values. So if you want to preserve missing values, you have to ask for them explicitly using, for example, the isNA function, which is um, located in the example below. So this one, in this example, it says filter data frame is DF, and then it's followed by an argument that has isNA x, and then um, another condition, which is x greater than one. So this is one of the exercises in the, in the book, in this particular um, part of the chapter. And uh, the question is, or the prompt is to find all the flights that were operated by United, American, or Delta. So these are all, or each of these are carriers. And so this shows a, um, just the first couple rows of the flights data frame, just so that we can look at um, the different columns and we can see that the carrier column is uh, is included here before flight number and then in this particular subset we can only see ua which is united um, but if we were to consider all of the different carriers possible in the data set which i've listed here there's a bunch of different ones and so ua is one of them and then there's also aa b6 dl ev and so on um, so United would be um, UA and then American would be AA, so American Airlines, and then Delta would be DL. And I've listed four different options here for how we might find all the flights that were operated by United, American, or Delta. So at this point, I was sort of thinking it could be a little interactive and people could say maybe which option they might use if they were going to use the filter function. I'm thinking option four or three would work, right? Mm -hmm. One, first two options fail? Yeah, exactly. So we'll just go through these one by one. So option one is listed here. Um, and it gives us an error. So the error is, is a problem with filter input and this is because it's, it's a really helpful error actually because it it asks you in the end did you mean carrier two equal signs um, equal to this and so that's that's one way in which this particular example isn't going to work to answer the question that we're after and so if we were to use two equal signs that also is not correct because um, of the way that we set up the comparisons in the in the argument and so and you get an error message for that as well and so options option three is different and so option three instead of having ua followed by the vertical pipe and then immediately by the other two carriers this uh, this way of trying to answer the question lists each argument separately um, and then separates them by the or operator or the vertical pipe. Um, and so that one did, did give us an output. And then option four gave us the same output. Um, and so option four also works and it's a little bit more, um, uh, I guess, concise, you could say. I prefer to use this notation just because it takes up a little less space and it becomes a little easier to read the code this way. Um, and so this is just laid out by saying that um, we're filtering flights using carrier that is contained in the list that has these three different options. Um, so it's checking for that and filtering based off of that. Okay, and then the next segment is to is arranging rows with a range. So this changes the order of the rows, so which means it just takes a data frame and orders it by a set of column names 
or more complicated expressions if you want. So it orders a column in ascending order by default, um, and then you would, you would have to use a different function or an additional function, um, DESC, to reorder a column in descending order. Um, I don't know how you'd say that function. I don't think I've ever said that function out loud. Um, anyway, that's the descending uh, function that you would use with, with a range. And then a note here is that missing values are always sorted at the end. Okay, so this is another exercise, and this one asks us to sort flights to find the most delayed flights, um, and then find the flights that left the earliest. So this is just another snapshot of the data set and the data frame. And if we wanted to start with the first part of that prompt, so sort flights to find the most delayed flights, um, we might use a range and then indicate which data frame we're talking about, which is flights. And then um, we were interested in the column that's labeled DEP delay. And because we want to see which ones, um, which flights are most delayed, then we would want to sort from most delayed to least delayed. And then we'd have to use that descending function, which is around the, the variable name DEP delay. And so here's another uh, question for the group is, what would it look like to, um, what would this example look like if we wanted to find the least delayed flights? I believe you would just leave out the descending function. Mm -hmm. So it returns the lowest, right? Yeah, exactly. And so you wouldn't have to use any different kind of function because um, a range by default sorts it in ascending order. And so, yeah, so Eric is right. You would just remove the descending function from around that variable. Okay, the next section is selecting columns with the select function. Um, because sometimes we have data sets that have hundreds or thousands of variables, which can be hard to manage and, and work with if you can't see all of them. And so you might just want to narrow down to the ones that are most relevant to the questions that you're looking to answer. Um, and in this particular data set, I think there's, I think there's only what, like 19 variables. Yeah. So there's 19 columns, 19 different variables. So it's not too bad, but, um, but there are definitely situations where you would be, where you might be handling hundreds or thousands of other variables and you might want to select columns so you can work with a more manageable data frame. Uh, select gives us a way to narrow down to only those variables that we're interested in. So it's super handy. And some of the helper functions that, um, that can be used with the select function um, are listed here. So one of them is starts with, and then you would indicate um, a string of, to match the names that begin in this example with ABC. Another example would be um, if you wanted to find something that ended in XYZ, then you could use ends with, and then just indicate XYZ in quotation marks. Um, similarly, if you wanted to match names that contained IJK, for example, then you would use contains and then indicate what you wanted to match with. And then there's also um, matches, which, which if you wanted to use a regular expression, you could use that option. And so this particular example matches any variables that contain repeated characters. Um, and then the book indicates that there's more about, more about this um, that will be covered in chapter 14, which is about strings. And then num range is another really useful um, select tool. And uh, in this example, it matches x1, x2, and x3. So that, that second piece of the argument indicates um, the number associated with the first argument, which is x. Um, so I would like to ask the group here if any of these are ones that, they, that people tend to use a lot. I, don't, I haven't personally played around too much with these, but I'm curious if other people use these a lot or find them useful. Just watching, just um, seeing you go over this, I thought of actually, I have a project that I'm working on mm -hmm. where the contains is going to actually be a huge asset because I basically have, I'm trying to create a 
table of, you know, what hospital beds are occupied at a certain point in time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, I can go and, you know, find the commonalities between our timestamps for the beds and our um, names for the columns for bed and um, make sure that those are in there and mm -hmm. turn that into, you know, part of the project. So this is actually awesome that we're going over this right now. Nice. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, I think I think there might be lots of situations where I could use some of these um, and I just haven't I haven't been because I haven't like sort of seen them in front of me like we are now. Um, one thing I really don't use very much at all is regular expressions whenever I work with strings like I'm really not very familiar with with how to use those efficiently. So when I look at this example in this list, I don't I don't really know. I'm not even sure what I'm looking at, you know? Um, so it's nice that it tells you what this example is because I, I wouldn't know. Um, but yeah, all very handy for sure. Okay, and then one of my favorite ones is the everything um, option, which is really useful when you want to move a few variables to the start of the data frame. Um, and there'll be, we'll talk about this a little bit more later on. Um, when we, when we get into the mutate function, mutate uh, by default when you, uh, so a mutate creates a new variable based off of variables that already exist. And when it creates that new variable, it puts it at the very end of the data frame. And oftentimes that's exactly the, the column that I wanna look at. And so um, being able to select the columns um, that I'm interested in and bring that new column to the front and then uh, everything else that I, you know, don't necessarily care about seeing right away um, kind of gets taken care of by this everything um, tool. So that's really nice. Because otherwise you'd have to like manually list the columns that you wanted to keep and that's just really tedious and not feasible if you're working with a lot of a lot of columns. Okay, so this exercise asks us to brainstorm as many ways as possible to select depth time, depth delay, uh, R time, and R delay. So um, departure time, departure delay, arrival time, and arrival delay from the flights data set. And so uh, this is a snapshot again of the flights data set, and we can see uh, the four different variables that the exercise is referring to. So we have um, departure, departure time here, we have departure delay here, uh, and then arrival delay, oh, and then arrival time. Okay, yeah. Um, so all four of them are within view. So what would be, uh, yeah, I guess maybe people, I have some examples that we can go through, but what would be some ways that we could use some of the tools we just went over to select these four um, columns. And I'll bring up that list again. The uh, two that strike out or that come together for me immediately are, you know, literally spelling all four columns out and then having mm -hmm. an or between them. And then the um, using ends with and then having time and delay as your mm -hmm. ends with this or that. Okay, nice. Yeah, I've got those included in the slide, so we can definitely go through those. Okay, so the first one is um, exactly as you said, it's kind of the more, the most straightforward, the most obvious one, um, which is just to, to explicitly name those variables that you're interested in looking at and narrowing down to. And so this example, um, again, it, it, it states the data frame in the first argument, which is flights. And then the rest of the arguments um, are dedicated to naming the variables that you're interested in looking at. Um, and so just like you mentioned, if you just um, indicate those variables in your arguments, then it will narrow it down to just those. And so we see a nice condensed um, data frame here of just the variables that we're interested in, which is great. Um, another one, <coughs> excuse me, another option um, might be to use the starts with uh, option. And so in this scenario, we're using starts with to find the variables that start with depth, which would include ideally, right, uh, depth time and then depth delay. And then also starts with 
R for arrival, so for to capture arrival time and arrival delay. And so if we flip back to the last example, it's the same, the output is the same, right? The data frame looks the same, so these both did the same thing. And then the other option that we talked about was using, instead of using starts with, we could use ends with. And so that one doesn't look the same. Um, and so here's a question for the group is why, why doesn't this option work? Matching too many columns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's not just the ones that we're interested in that match up with those, um, with those, um, I don't even know what you'd call it. Uh, I guess with the, just with the way that you're selecting for columns, there's more columns that match those descriptors than than we're interested in. And so this one doesn't quite work. Um, and so I guess that's just something to keep in mind when you're when you're exploring your, your data frame and you wanna make sure that you're using the right, um, the right tools and with the right names and everything. Okay, so the other step is, or the other segment is to add new variables with mutate. So I mentioned this a little bit ago. Um, so this function helps you add new columns that are functions of existing columns. And it always adds columns at the end of your data set, like I mentioned earlier. And if you want to only keep the new variables that you made with mutate, you can actually use transmute instead of mutate. Um, and I don't, I don't personally find myself using that one too much. Is that something that anyone in the group um, uses on the regular basis? Not here. Never. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I just, I just don't use it. I could see how it would be handy, I guess. I just don't, um, I don't know. I think I just like having it all, all there. Um, yeah, anyway. But that's an option. If you only wanted to keep the new variables, you can use transmute. Um, and trans or mutate can be used with uh, arithmetic operators. So the kind of standard ones, plus, minus, multiply, uh, divide, and then um, uh, the caret. And then you can also use functions like sum. And you can use uh, modular ar arithmetic with it. So in integer division, remainder, and then log functions as well. And then some other things you can use with mutate are logical comparisons, like the ones we talked about earlier. Um, also offsets like lead and lag, and then uh, other functions like ranking. So min rank, row number, or dense rank, and then lots of other choices. Um, whoops, actually I wanted to stop there. So this is another spot where there's a bunch of options that I don't use myself. So I'm curious to know if you, if any of you use some of these like for example offsets and ranking i don't ever use those i use those all the time you'll find especially like row number and the offsets are mm -hmm. very useful okay what kind of scenarios would you say you use those in the most um for quartiles or percentiles or you can do your own um you can give it a row number and then group by the uh, row number. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Nice. Can you and then you can also then use the row number as a filter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see how that'd be useful. I've used the integer division um, sometimes to take something that is in 24 hour format well, actually, well, something that I basically need to do, you know, by the hour. Uh huh. And luckily in a hospital, you know, people are fine with using 24 hour format. So if you say like, you know, 0200 or if you say 1700, they know what you're talking about. Uh huh. So there are a lot of times where, you know, I'll just split it up and say, you know, give me the hour and the time that they came in. And I'm like, okay, well, we had this many people come in during this hour. Mm. I could see how that'd be useful too. I wouldn't have considered that, but yeah, definitely. And I guess that would be, that's something that's handy with this data set too. I don't remember if there was an example using that in the book. 
but I do think that there's a variable where that could come in handy there too. Yeah, and if you group by and then do row number, that can be super useful as well because you can actually index within um, groups. Mm -hmm. Nice, good to know. Thank you. Okay, and then the next segment is about grouped summaries using summarize. Um, and this collapses a data frame into a single row and then it's more useful. You can use it on its own, but it's more useful when you combine it with group by, which has been mentioned a couple of times already. Arguably, it's most useful when used with the pipe operator. Um, now, I, I realize as I've been flipping through these slides that I've already used the pipe operator. Um, so I apologize that I introduced it before talking about what it was. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit more now. Um, so the pipe operate, operator lets you go from something like this, which is um, in this example, we're, we're assigning to by dust, um, group by, and then flights and destination or dust. And so it's literally taking the flights data set and grouping it by uh, this variable, which is the destination. And then we're assigning that to by dust. And then the next step is to use summarize. And so in this step, you are summarizing by by dust, which you defined earlier. And then um, and then you have you're counting the number of observations, and then you're creating some additional variables using the mean function, for example. And then you're assigning that um, a new variable name. And so if you wanted to use the pipe operator, which I recommend, it would look more like this. And so instead of having to do these intermediate steps of, of saving um, a series of steps and assigning it a variable name, you could just start with your, um, your data set and then you could do steps sequentially after that. Um, and so it's one step after another and the pipe operator lets you break those steps up um, neatly. And so it looks a little bit different because instead of, actually, I'll stop here. So what would be, what are some of the things that stick out as being like, if we were to play like spot the difference between the two examples, what would be some of the things that look different between the two, aside from the pipe operator? The big thing is not having to declare the data set every time. Yeah. Mm hmm for sure yeah so in this in the first example you have your data set and the first argument flights and then in the second example we take that out and um, it exists outside of that function and so it's feeding into the functions that come afterwards um, and because you can just do one step after another without having to uh, reintroduce the data set it does become really useful in that sense. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Yeah, I think that's I think that's it. I think the rest of the stuff looks the same. But yeah, that's definitely a huge one. So you have your starting point, and the way that you can think about it is you have your starting point, which in this scenario is your flights data set, and then you're feeding it into these functions. And so the first step is you're grouping by destination, and then the second step is you're summarizing and creating some new variables. And then um, with group mutate and filters, they're most useful in combination with summarize. And uh, for example, we have uh, popular desks and that's being assigned to flights, uh, piped into group by destination, piped into um, filtering. And so there's like a filter argument there. And so the question for this section is what does this do? Um, like, what is this example doing? What are we trying to find out by, by running this example? Any guesses? Is this flights that run more than once a day? Destinations that are flown to more than once a day? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, you're, def you're grouping by destination, you're filtering. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to think about it. Um, 
Yeah, I don't think that's explicitly how it was mentioned in the book, but yeah, I think that way makes more sense. It's a little more intuitive. Um, but yeah, you're exactly right. So you have this flights data set that you start with, and then you're feeding it into uh, the next step, which is to group by destination. And then that's feeding it into a following step. So once you've already grouped by, then you are filtering that by um, destinations that have more than 365 observations. So yeah, you could think about it like, um, like more than once a day. So they're popular destinations. That's the whole point of the, of the uh, exercise here. Um, so nice. I That's think super powerful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Were you, you mean group mutate in general? Oh, that, no, the, the, the option to filter by a summary value that you're not actually, um, but you're not producing a summarized, mm. you're able to filter by that summary, even though it doesn't output a summary. Like, that's great. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, because I oftentimes, if I want to, like, I find myself making new variables, like, all the time. Um, like I'll use mutate often and I'll make new variables and, and then refer to those new variables. Um, and so I don't often, yeah, take this approach where I'm kind of summarizing something within, within the pipeline, but yeah. Yeah, me either. That'd be a nice, uh, technique to add. Mm hmm Yeah, definitely. Okay, friends, I think that might be it. Yep. That's the end. All right. That, you had a super dense chapter to have to break down into, you know, whatever amount of time we have. And I think you did a fantastic job here. So thank oh, you for thank that. You. Thank you.